as you mentioned, 120,000 people are at least missing uh, in the last 12 years, most of them according to human rights uh, organizations by the Assad regime. The 1st of March 2022, I met in uh, Tbilisi airport, Georgia, and uh, I decided to find my uh, soulmates, my uh, like-minded people to start a new activity outside the Russia, but with the uh, anti-war agenda. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to the Struggle Video News. The politicians in Congress gave thunderous applause to the Israeli president as he delivered the same stale platitudes and lies about the strength of Israel's democracy. Just weeks after the attack on the Janine refugee camp and months after the Hawara race riot, and as the Prime Minister of Israel is seeking to gut the power of its Supreme Court. President Herzog certainly didn't have a word to say about how his soldiers shot dead three-year-old Mohammed Tamimi in Nabi Saleh. It would be enough to turn your stomach, except the same has been going on in our Congress for decades. Only a handful of members of Congress stayed away from the spectacle. There was a kerfuffle in Congress when member Pramila J. Apol, being pressed by angry protesters, said Israel was a racist state. The next day, when attacked by 42 members of her own party, she backtracked. But what else can you call Israel? A racist apartheid state. Just this week, there was a discussion in the Israeli media about a Israeli politician who nobly gave up one of his kidneys to a perfect stranger, provided that stranger was not a non-Jew. Here's an example of the real Israel, video provided by the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem. On June 21st, around 2 a.m., dozens of settlers drove into the neighborhood of the village of Luban al Garbia. The settlers attacked homes with stones and torched six cars parked in a car repair shop yard, as well as a car wash, and smashed windows of three parked cars. The settlers also went into a supermarket and smashed its store windows and damaged a refrigerator. When local residents came out to defend their property, a military jeep blocked their way, separating the settlers from the residents until the settlers decided to leave. In the Middle East, at an Iranian airport, the heat index reached 152 degrees, a level at or surpassing that which with the human body can withstand. A taste of things to come as the establishment deals with climate collapse as, it, as if it was just another issue to be dealt with, with the usual deals and bribes and subsidies, this time to the carbon criminals. With that, we'll be eager to hear from Dr. Mazen Kumsia when he speaks in Connecticut on August 8th and 9th. Kumsia is co-founder of the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability, based at Bethlehem University. More on this next week. Democracy Now! interviewed Syrian-American Dr. Zahra Salul in early July. He fills in viewers on a lot of news and events that they have probably been missing for a long time. Salul in 2020 was co-winner of the Gandhi Peace Award. 
This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh as we turn to Syria. Humanitarian groups Wednesday urged the United Nations Security Council to extend Syria's cross border aid mechanism for another year in order to ensure the delivery of humanitarian aid to more than 4 million people in northwest Syria after 12 years of war. The mechanism was established in 2014 to enable the UN and other humanitarian groups to provide aid to opposition held areas in Syria without the authorization of the Syrian government. Government. Doctors Without Borders reports the number of authorized crossing points is now down from four to one, even after an earthquake devastated parts of Syria in February, and the need is enormous. Meanwhile, the United Nations General Assembly's approved a resolution to establish an independent body to investigate what happened to more than 130,000 people who've gone missing during the conflict in Syria, and to, quote, provide adequate support to victims, survivors, and the families of those missing. The government, the Syrian government, opposed the resolution, along with Russia, China, Belarus, North Korea, Cuba and Iran. This comes as ITV News reports that in the days leading up to the failed mutiny by Wagner Group in Russia, Syrian officials were in talks to increase the number of Wagner fighters in Syria and make Syria its biggest base as part of a lucrative deal with President Bashar al-Assad. In a minute, we're going to look at a new BBC documentary investigating Assad's role in producing the highly addictive amphetamine known as Captagon and how this is impacting his relations with Saudi Arabia and other countries. But we begin with Dr. Zahar Salul, president and CEO of the medical nonprofit MedGlobal, which provides health care in disaster regions, including Syria. He was also a classmate of Bashar al-Assad in medical school. Yes, the president of Syria is also a doctor. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Dr. Zahar Salul. Start off with talking about the 120,000 people it's estimated are missing in the 12 years of this conflict, doctor. Uh, thank you, Amy, for having me. Um, and this is one of the most painful chapters in the Syrian crisis. Um, as you mentioned, 120,000 people are at least missing uh, in the last 12 years, most of them, according to human rights uh, organizations by the Assad regime, about 85 percent of them. Uh, one of them is um, a dentist and also the chess champion in Syria. Her name is Dr. Rania Abbasi, who disappeared in 2013 by the Assad regime intelligence uh, in the prison with her six children. One of them was 1.5, one year and, and, and a half, and the, the, the oldest was 13 years old. She still disappeared, and no one knows where she. But she's, she's one of tens of thousands of women and children and men who disappeared by the Assad regime, and their families do not know any information about them. Some of the family members got to know that their um, loved ones uh, have died under torture by looking at the pictures of the Caesar files, which, as you remember, this is a person who smuggled um, about 30,000 pictures of people who died under torture by the Assad regime, and some family members discovered that their loved ones died because of torture. Um, so hopefully this uh, will allow the families of the loved ones who, who, who their loved ones, uh, sons, children, um, uh, sisters, um, and, 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 and fathers have disappeared, to have one source of information about uh, their uh, their family members and hopefully uh, have a closure for this uh, painful chapter. Uh, Dr. Sahlul, how is this mechanism, uh, this institution, uh, likely to work? Uh, what uh, tools will uh, people have to find uh, these disappeared people? I, I mean, I, I, I suppose the assumption is they're either in the prison system or have been killed. Um, when I was young, growing in Syria, my uncle, who was um, in high school, also was forcefully disappeared, or actually was detained by the father, the, the, the father of current president, Hafez al-Assad. And I remember my grandmothers going every week uh, to the local um, authorities, the intelligence authorities, trying to find some information about him. And every week she comes back humiliated and not knowing what's going on with him. He stayed in the Palmyra prison for 12 years, and then suddenly he, he appeared. Uh, so many of the family members do not know any information about their loved ones. They go from place to place. They contact human rights organizations, different ones. So this new entity hopefully will allow 
more coordination between the different human rights organizations uh, that collect information about the families and the, and the victims. It should have representations of the victims, uh, the survivals of torture, and also the families, so their voice can be heard. Um, and so that way you have one stop for everyone who lost someone who um, has someone disappeared in the prisons of Assad, and also other entities who are in Syria. You have also oppositions groups and the SDF who also detained uh, and forcefully di disappeared uh, other victims. Could you talk about, you've uh, gone to Syria multiple times uh, to assist in providing medical assistance. You were there just earlier this year after the earthquake. Could you describe the conditions in Syria now? Uh, reportedly 90 percent, up to 90 percent of Syrians are now living in poverty. It's uh, devastating. Uh, it's painful for me because uh, I grew up in Syria and then came to United States and practicing uh, physician. Every time I go there, and I see the deterioration of the condition and the level of um, this, you know, disparity uh, and also the number of displaced people. Um, I was inside Idlib, northwest of Syria, providing some training on a new technology that helps physicians uh, to treat trauma patients. Uh, but uh, I was in the middle of large IDP camp that has 500,000 people. Uh, everywhere you see around, you see tents. There is 1.5 million people who live in tents in Idlib. Uh, half of the population, 4 million that you've mentioned in your report, are displaced from cities like Homs and Damascus and Aleppo. Uh, and they cannot imagine uh, going back to their cities with the Assad regime still uh, in, in control. Um, and the economic situation is horrible. Uh, the children are everywhere. You, you, you look in the camp, but there is no enough schooling. Um, education is one of the most um, hit sectors in the in the um, in the economy there, uh, and many parts of Syria. Also, healthcare is one of the worst hit. According to the WHO, half of the hospitals have been attacked by the Assad regime and by Russia. Uh, you mentioned in your previous piece about the Russian attacks on Chechnya. We believe in Syria that because what happens in Syria, you have now the war in Ukraine. There is direct link between what happened in Syria, where the Russians used illegal weapons. They trained their army. They used, according to them, 300 uh, new weapons in Syria. They targeted hospitals and uh, um, and uh, civilian buildings, like what they did today in Lviv. And now they're doing it in Ukraine, because the war did not pay attention to what they were doing in Syria. We record on July 20th, in just one month, on August 21st. It will be 10 years after the horrific sarin gas massacre in Syria by Assad forces. Hopefully the 1,400 deaths will be memorialized properly. Interestingly enough, there's a new formation, the Syrian-Ukrainian Network. Syrians and Ukrainians who both suffer from Russian imperialism. Look for it on Facebook. We continue now with more of the Nonviolence International program about Russians who fled the country because they opposed Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Nikita Rakhmov is a Russian psychologist and psychotherapist with eight years of practice he now works with Russians who have fled conscription and emigrated in connection with the mobilization for war. After a few days after my movement to Kazakhstan, I understood I need to use my profession to support uh, Russians. Uh, and um, uh, right now, we even don't know how to uh, in, in, identificate ourselves because uh, clearly, we are not immigrants, we are not refugees, uh, we don't know who we are right now. <laughs> it's, it's really weird uh, for this problem. And um, uh, because of my profession, I can say not only about my feelings, but also about uh, feelings and problems of my clients, uh, Russians that left Russia because of mobilization. And I think that the main problem right now is future. There is no understanding about uh, what's going to be. Uh, a lot of Russians want to come back to Russia, but they can't do it right now. 
some of them uh, coming back uh, because of their problems with uh, um, work, finance problems, problems with their uh, family, because not, uh, not everybody could take their family with them, right, to uh, any country. Um, but the main problem, I would say, is future, because um, there is no way to just wait um, the moment Russia is going to end this war. When you're an immigrant, you need to um, plan in your life uh, abroad. Yes, I would say there are, was a lot of uh, people that was planning there just uh, for two or three months abroad and uh, it's going to be quickly, this war is going to be quickly and they, they could be uh, uh, just uh, come back to Russia. But uh, someday they realized there is no this scenario, right? And um, this is why I think there is no way to just um, wait of this ending of war. You need to plan your life abroad. But if you need to plan your life abroad, your problem is, uh, the first year of your problem is work. And a second problem is uh, the country. Right, because um, there are a lot of problems with moving to some countries. Because, uh, for example, in Kazakhstan, where I, I live right now, uh, for nowadays, uh, it's uh, it's safety. It looks like it's safety, but um, Russians clearly understand that uh, this safety can. Um, can be removed or can be deleted or you know. And uh, you need to go uh, forward. You need to find another country. And um, when you uh, move to uh, move abroad uh, so quickly without life strategy for this uh, Im immigration, um, it's really hard to, to understand your plan. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of the most, the biggest problem. And this is the thing I was, uh, I was trying to say. That's it. Evgeny Lyman is a 25-year-old civil activist from Moscow who left Russia right at the start of last February's invasion. He now lives in the country of Georgia. It's an honor to be here with you, and thank you very much for the invitation to this webinar. Um, in the beginning, um, Andre said that there are three categories of uh, anti-war Russians abroad. And to be honest, I'm from the second sector uh, due to his classification, because as Barbara, uh, Barbara said, I had uh, a civic and political experience uh, in activism uh, prior to the full-scale invasion of Russian forces to Ukraine. Um, I'm just 25 years old. I uh, finished the university. I'm a political, um, I'm so sorry, political scientist. I finished uh, high school of economics in 2021. And uh, uh, from the last uh, classes of my school, I had uh, a clear, um, a clear feeling of civicness in the Russian dictatorship. And I decided to take part in different uh, civic activities. Uh, for example, in 2018, I, with my colleagues, found a project about uh, discussion on political and socio-economical um, themes in Russia for Russian youth. And uh, to be honest, it's a nonsense for nowadays, I think. The project exists now in Russia, and uh, this project uh, gave uh, a lot of Russian youth who are anti-war, uh, who had anti-war position nowadays. Uh, 
I think that uh, my colleagues who uh, are working with them are heroes because they are in Russia and everybody knows which repression and uh, suppression of freedom of voice, freedom of media uh, now are in Russia. So uh, I fled Russia on the second day of the full-scale invasion. I'm so sorry, on the third on the fourth day, because on the second day I was arrested for taking part in anti-war uh, protest, and uh, nobody knew which um, repression and which punishment uh, would be implemented to those who uh, were arrested uh, on the first days of the full-scale invasion, and a lot of people fled Russia due to these uh, reasons. So uh, the 1st of March 2022, I met in uh, Tbilisi airport, Georgia, and uh, I decided to find my uh, soulmates, my uh, like-minded people to start a new activity outside the Russia, but with the uh, anti-war agenda. And in April, uh, we established an organization which is called Immigration for Action. We uh, are providing uh, medicines to Ukrainian refugees here in Georgia. And for a uh, year and a half, we helped more than 7,000 refugees with the medications here. Because uh, in Georgia, there is a humanitarian catastrophe with the Ukrainian refugees because of uh, local authorities um, uh, had, uh, have just uh, limited help to Ukrainians. I'm so sorry for the interruptions in my English. Um, <clears throat> And uh, uh, when the mobilization started in Russia, uh, my organization decided to help to those people who were stuck uh, between the borders of Russia and Georgia. There also was a three or four days humanitarian catastrophe because it is a tunnel in a mountain and uh, the uh, amount of uh, people who uh, were gathered there was uh, ex ex extraordinary. So uh, yes, we had uh, a humanitarian action. And uh, here, and now we also gave anti-war Russian people here in Belize. And uh, as I understood, the main theme of the webinar is the activities of Russian diaspora abroad. And to me, it is honor to announce that uh, for more than a year, there was a big coalition of different anti-war Russian projects, initiatives, uh, organizations, media, and uh, other types of activism. And uh, in the early July, there would be that there will be a uh, announcement in public. Uh, the start of anti-war uh, anti initiatives platform. It is more than, um, it, gave, it, gave, it gave that more than uh, 150 different Russian anti-war initiatives abroad from uh, all the world, from different countries, Europe, American, um, Caucasian, Central Asia and other organizations. And uh, I took part in the building of that coalition. Um, and uh, I think that the perspectives of our collective actions are, uh, will be productive, will be resultful, and the world uh, would, uh, uh, not would, will hear the voice of anti-war Russians, which... And finally, we have Alexei Prohorenko, and he is an independent journalist from Russia now living in Warsaw, Poland. Alexei left Moscow in late September 2022 after the partial mobilization was announced in Russia. And we are going to take your questions. 
and your queries. As soon as Alex A finishes, we're going to have a rich exchange with you. We're going to connect the dots across the world and across the speakers. So Alex A, could you um, please unmute yourself and share with us what have been the experiences you've had of fleeing the war and the challenges you face and how we can help? Uh, well, uh, uh, hello, my name is uh, Alexei Prokhorenko and uh, uh, like with uh, many of, of us here, um, my life uh, was split by uh, the uh, awful day of July, uh, of uh, uh, February 24 into, uh, the two, into two parts, before and after. So before that, I... Uh, spent some 15 to 20 years working as a conference interpreter, uh, trying to bring uh, closer, uh, uh, Russia closer to the West, trying to build bridges between the cultures, between uh, Russian culture and uh, Russian politics and Western cultures and Western politics. And uh, I woke up uh, uh, on February 24, 2022, only to realize that I had failed. And my um, uh, work, my um, uh, efforts had largely been in vain. Um, and uh, uh, as as soon as the war, uh, as soon as the war broke out, I tried to do something. Uh, well, going to uh, going to protest was not an option because police would immediately just grasp you and put you into prison and make you pay. Like at that time, it was uh, fifty dollars. Uh, so just to support the war. So I started to talk to people wh wherever I met people, uh, shop assistants, uh, people in the drugstore, in the uh, um, on 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 the streets of Moscow. And I started to persuade them that it's uh, to try. I, I tried to knock on the door of their souls and, and minds. Uh, and uh, the only thing I. I noticed was fear, fear to talk about the cost of war. I also uh, posted stickers, uh, posters bi that big and small stickers in uh, the subway, uh, in public places. So if anyone would uh, think they're alone in uh, their negation of war, so they would change their mind and uh, see that they, they're not alone. And so I did, so uh, I was doing that uh, over more or less uh, seven months until uh, another dire date, uh, which was uh, September 21, uh, 2022 again, uh, uh, the day when uh, uh, mobilization, uh, mobilization was uh, announced and uh, really uh, people started to get grasped, to get grabbed in the streets at random, completely. And uh, then I decided that uh, I'd, I'd rather leave uh, uh, the country, not because I'm uh, apt for military service, I'm uh, a reserve lieutenant of uh, the Russian army. So uh, I would never uh, figure that I would ever face the uh, risk of going to war. And uh, mm, I decided to just uh, leave for Turkey. I remember um, getting up uh, early in the morning to, just to find the, the ticket at, at whatever price uh, I found a ticket to Istanbul. So I spent uh, two months in Turkey trying to figure out my future and uh, I was lucky to get a humanitarian visa to Poland with the help of my friends. I was able to come to Warsaw uh, which is uh, a significantly better place uh, to uh, engage in certain activities, uh, anti-war activities. Uh, for example, uh, if we talk about uh, the Russian diaspora in Istanbul, it's uh, very, um, I would say it's it's uh, rather uh, shapeless. So it's it's not uh, the people there are uh, rather fleeing from a certain uh, threat. Not, not because they they hate the war they don't they want the war to stop it's just uh, i i heard an opinion in, in istanbul that uh, let the missiles uh, do their job i don't want to go go die in the war 
So it's like it's very selfish and uh, very stupid, I think, and very uh, mean to say that. But uh, just to, just to give you one example, we did uh, it, it, Istanbul was one of the one of the few cities worldwide where it, we didn't have uh, product protests uh, on uh, the first anniversary of the war. But we did have that in Warsaw, so we had a small gathering of. Uh, and Russians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians alike uh, to mark the, the first anniversary of the war in uh, uh, in uh, February, on February 25. Uh, but here in Warsaw, the, the Russian diaspora is not strong either. It's not uh, uh, too, um, uh, it's not too numerous, uh, not, too, not too active. Um, there are people who are buying diesel engines uh, to uh, for the Ukrainians who organize that, and uh, we also have sometimes uh, discussions on Wednesdays uh, on uh, certain topics like from cyber warfare, uh, cyber security, all the way down to political issues to the issues of uh, uh, persecution of dissidents, uh, uh, and uh, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, the diaspora is too atomized, too uh, dispersed uh, to bring it together, unlike uh, the Belarusian diaspora and especially the Ukrainian diaspora of Warsaw. So that is, that, these are the main challenges because we have, uh, we, have um, the, or we, we have the places where we could gather. We have uh, the people uh, with, the, with the intent to help us uh, uh, do so. But the people, uh, the the, the uh, general uh, diaspora, uh, will uh, is really uh, difficult to work with. The, there's apathy, maybe maybe there is also fear. I don't know, but, but it's not it's not active at all. And uh, the, one of the challenges that we are having here is to make people more uh, engaged, more involved in in the process in, in the processes that uh, uh, are important right now. And uh, one other challenge is uh, probably the perception of Russians. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know how uh, it could be changed, but uh, maybe uh, time needs to uh, pass before um, really uh, the people in the West, uh, the governments especially, start to discern between uh, uh, Russians and Russians, between those who support or buy into Putin's propaganda and those who who really um, uh, are uh, sick and tired of it, who really think it's, it's uh, very uh, evil and uh, vile. Thank yes. you so much. That's our program for today. See you next time on The Struggle Video News.